Let's uh, take our Bibles this evening and open them to Acts 10. Um, As you know, in our verse-by-verse study in the book of Acts, Peter in Joppa, which is that circle uh, down south, has performed two major miracles. He's brought someone out that's been bedridden, I think, for eight years. And then he brought someone back from the dead. So he's on a roll, I would say. So... The whole trajectory is to get him up north to Caesarea, where he's going to lead the first full-fledged Gentile to Christ. So this unit, Acts 10, verse 1, all the way through chapter 11, verse 18, is all about how the first Gentile got saved, which is a huge step forward in the development of the church. All the converts at this point have either been full Jews, proselytes, or half-breeds like the Samaritans. Um, But here, what's going to happen is the first Gentile is going to be brought to Christ. And, of course, the man um, reading this is Theophilus, who is wondering if Christianity is for him, because everything looks so Jewish. So you could imagine the impact this would have on him, confirming him in his faith, because he too is a Roman Gentile, as we've talked about. So I think that's why Dr. Luke spent so much time on this initial conversion of the first Gentile. So what has happened this far, this thus far is Cornelius, the Gentile who's about to be saved, got a vision from God that Peter was going to come and give him the gospel. Simultaneous with that is God is communicating to Peter. Cornelius is in Caesarea. Peter is still in Joppa. That the age of the law is over. We're now in the church age. And you're to cooperate with this delegation that Cornelius is going to send to fetch you from Joppa and bring you back to Caesarea. And then part three is the visions application where Cornelius dispatches three Gentiles to travel from Caesarea to Joppa to fetch Peter. And Peter goes. He leaves Joppa and he goes to Caesarea And he steps foot into the house of a Gentile in Caesarea as a Jew, which Jewish tradition forbade. Uh, And he's able to do that because he had the vision of the sheet and the animals in the sheet that the age of the law has been set aside. And so there is Cornelius and his closest uh, companions, his friends and his family, because he knows Peter is going to Whatever Peter's going to say, it's, it's going to be very important. God, God on the front end told him this. And verse 33, which we concluded last time, concludes with Cornelius in his house with his closest friends and family. And he basically says to Peter, the floor is yours. You know, God, God told us you were coming. And I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. I can't wait what you have to say. So... Uh, would, would, I wish all churches were that way, right? The pastor walks in, everybody's just sitting on the edge of their seat. Can't wait for what the pastor has to say. And that's kind of what's going on here with um, this man, Cornelius, who does not know the name Jesus Christ yet, but he is an honest God seeker. So what we're going to look at tonight is verses 34 through 43, where Peter is going to speak and he's going to give a message. And you kind of get the idea that he can't even get the message out before Cornelius and his group believes. Uh, Peter had more to say, but what he said was enough, and they believe, and, and they have a what we would call a Gentile Pentecost, which we'll look at verses 44 through 48 next time, which, by the way, won't be next Wednesday, right? 
If you show up next Wednesday, you'll think you missed the rapture because that's Thanksgiving weekend. And so we got to prepare to eat, right? So there we have it. Um, so that salvation is going to happen in verses 44 through 48. And what we're looking at tonight is what did Peter say? And w- what a great study for us because we're going to be put in positions constantly uh, where we have the opportunity to share the faith with unsaved people that may not even know the name Jesus. What do we say? You know, what do we talk about? What do we emphasize? What do we highlight? I had a, my primary spiritual gift is not evangelism, but I had a great opportunity to share my faith this week. I've been praying to the Lord for opportunities and then you, sh- you should pray that as well because you wouldn't believe the situations that God will put you in through appointment cancellations or something where you'll be next to someone and you'll have an opportunity, not so much in a coerced way, but in a natural way, you know, talk about spiritual things. And this particular individual wanted to know what I did, you know, for a living. And I'm like, are you sure you want to know? I, I said, I'm a pastor. He goes, really? What do you do as a pastor? Because, you know, he wanted to know if it was a high-stress job. or. I said, well, not really. You know, there's a lot of good things about it. And I tried to sort of explain what I did, um, you know, that I teach and I write books. And he wanted to know what books I had written. And I... I told him I had written a book called The Middle East Meltdown where I was talking about the different players in the last days that will surround Israel. And he said, really? And he was from Haiti. He said, is Haiti mentioned in the Bible's prophecies? And I said, well, not that I can see, but... You know, you can see from just that little conversation, I had an opportunity to springboard into, you know, the gospel and, you know, just asking him the question that got me saved. I just asked him, you know, if you were to die and and, uh, stand before the Lord and he were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? uh, What would you say? And he gave the same answer I gave when I was 16. A lot of eyes. I did this, I did that. And from there, I had the chance to just sort of show him, you know, that it's not about us, it's about what he did. And that's how you can know with 100% certainty, you know, that you can go to heaven. And he was talking about how, you know, he's quit drinking and he's quit carousing and he's quit hanging around with the wrong crowd. And I said, well, that stuff's admirable, but it really doesn't get you into heaven. And so just a wonderful opportunity. The Lord just stuck right in front of me. Um, It wasn't one of those things where he immediately trusted Christ, you know, that I could tell. But a seed was planted. And I just pray that the Lord will water it and bring it to fruition later. You know, when you study these things that the Apostle Peter is talking about to Cornelius, you sort of know how to guide the the conversation when the Lord puts you in those situations. So with all of that being said, you know, that's, that's why this little paragraph here, or it's not really so much little paragraph, it's a big paragraph, is important to us. So what Peter's going to do is he is going to turn the keys, Because you'll recall in Matthew 16, Jesus told Peter, to you is given the keys of the kingdom. So that's why it's always Peter that has the first bite of the apple to lead different people groups to Christ. He leads the first Jews to Christ, Acts 2. He leads the first uh, half-breed group, the Samaritans, to Christ. At least he lays hands as the Holy Spirit is given, Acts 8. And now he is going to give, be give, he's given this golden opportunity as he walks into the house of this uh, unsaved Gentile, a, a God seeker who doesn't know the name Jesus. He's going to be given the opportunity to lead the first Gentile, Gentiles to Christ. And what's going to follow is a Gentile Pentecost, 
once Cornelius and his entourage believes, Peter will say that's exactly what happened to us Jews at the beginning when we got saved. And when I taught on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 about Jews came to Christ. So here comes the things that Peter is talking about as he is now turning the keys that, that Jesus gave him a third time. Uh, first, we have an introduction, verses 34 and 35. What is the first thing that Peter focuses on? He focuses on the fact that God is not a respecter of persons. It says opening his mouth, and at some point you got to open your mouth. Just being nice to people and mowing their lawn. I know a guy that calls evangelism going and mowing his neighbor's lawn, which is a very nice thing to do, but nobody got saved that way. I mean, if you're using it as a bridge builder or something, I, I get it, but at some point you've got to get away from mowing the lawn and you got to say something. So Peter opened his mouth, and you remember Philip had to open his mouth when he led the Ethiopian eunuch to Christ in Acts 8, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, and you can't have a word without speech. So Peter opens his mouth. It says, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. Why does he understand that now? Because God gave him a vision of animals in the sheet saying, arise and eat, meaning the age of the law is over, and you can go into a Gentile's home because God loves the Gentiles. Deuteronomy 10 verse 17 says of God that he is awesome and does not show partiality nor take a bribe. Second Chronicles 9 verse 17 says, be very careful what you do for the Lord our God will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality or the taking of a bride. Bribe, excuse me. He did take a bride, that would be us, right? But not a bribe. And of course, when God blessed Abraham, going back to the beginning, and created the nation of Israel, it was very clear that the reason he blessed Israel is he wanted to bless the world through Israel. So Israel's blessings were not just for Israel. So there's a missional purpose uh, right at the beginning of, the, of Scripture, Genesis 12, verse 3, where God said to Abram, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Isaiah 42, verse 8 says, Israel is a light to the nations. Isaiah 49, verse 6 says, I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. And even in the prophecies related to the coming kingdom, we know that the Gentiles are going to be there. Amos 9 verse 12 says that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord who does this. The nations, the, in Hebrew, the goyim. So God blessed Israel, not to just bless Israel, but he blessed Israel so Israel would be a blessing to, other, to the world. So earlier, Jonathan was praising the Lord for God's blessings on Sugarland Bible Church, and that's a wonderful thing to think about. But we have to understand that God doesn't bless us just to bless us. He wants to use us to reach other people. So we're blessed to be a blessing. I mean, if you're blessed in any way in your life, that blessing is not just for you. That blessing is God wants to use you to reach um, a lost and dying world. Why? Because God is not an American. He's not a Canadian. He's not uh, an Israeli purely. Um, he is the God of Israel, but he wants to bless the whole world. And so this is what Peter means when he says, I see now that God doesn't show partiality. So he got a little bit stuck in his Judaism. Uh, 
You know, and that was easy for the Jews to forget that they're there to bless the Gentiles, not to look down on them. And 1,500 years of the law, they kind of got a little bit inbred. So that's why he saw the vision of the sheet and the animals in the sheet saying, arise and eat. And he's saying, now I realize that God does not show partiality. That's why I've stepped into the home as a devout Jew of you, Cornelius, a Gentile. And then you go down to verse 2, and it talks here about how righteousness is available in any nation. It says, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. So God wants people to fear him. Fearing God, meaning respecting God, is a good thing. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, right? I've used this uh, frequently. Um, that, that's our SAT scores in America taking a precipitous decline in 1962, which was the year the Supreme Court you know, pushed Bible reading and prayer out of schools. And that's when America, we really got stupid, to be honest with you. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning not just of wisdom, which is knowledge applied, but it's knowledge itself. The brain can't work the way it's supposed to when it's not submitted to God. So I was very heartened to see that Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma, wants to bring back you know, the Ten Commandments in the school, Bible and prayer in school. I was sort of heartened to see a little two-minute um, video by President-elect Trump saying we need the Bible and what he called religion, you know, back in the United States, and that's all very encouraging. Uh, a little bit late to the party, but encouraging nonetheless because that's when people start to get really smart again, when they have a fear and respect for God. So God is looking for people in, in every nation that will fear or respect him. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says this, in verse 35, Peter recognized the fact of Gentile acceptance. But in every nation, he that fears him and works righteousness is acceptable to him. The one who fears God obviously has faith. And the one who has faith will hopefully work righteousness as the evidence of that faith. Such a person is acceptable to God and God is looking for people any, anywhere, everywhere, all over the world, regardless of where they live, ethnicity, that will trust in him and then seek to live a godly life through progressive sanctification. Anywhere, everywhere, people want to do that. God says the welcome, the welcome is out to do that, including you, Cornelius. And then Peter here highlights Yeshua, that's the Hebrew name for Jesus, his work. So here's some things that you can focus on when the Lord puts you in it, it gives you the privilege of, of sharing your faith with a lost person. He talks, first of all, about Yeshua's preparation, and you see that in verse 36. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. So first and foremost, it came to Israel. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel. They were given the first opportunity to receive the kingdom and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 10, verses 5 through 7 says, These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So they were given a golden opportunity to receive the king and the kingdom, which they nationally turned down. But God took lemons and turned it into lemonade, right? He used that horrible miscarriage of justice 
where they violated all their legal rules to, to run him through the legal system and get him turned over to Rome quickly to get him killed as quickly as they could. Um, horrible miscarriage of justice, he used that to pay the sin debt of the whole world. So God took a tragedy and turned it into a triumph. But this is the preaching of peace through Jesus. Christmas is coming up, right? Here's what's going to be on some of your Christmas cards. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on forevermore, the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's going to bring political peace to this world. You guys believe that? But before he brings political peace to the world, he's got to deal with something else, the state of warfare between sinful man and, and a holy God. He brings peace to that situation first. That's what happens when you trust Christ. You're no longer God's enemy, but you're reconciled to God. And so this is what Peter focuses on as he's talking to Cornelius. And Jesus is entitled to do this because he's Lord of all. So you're put in a situation to share your faith. You could talk about peace with God, what that, what that means. Because the world, they'll, get you to, they'll, they'll, they'll want you to start talking about political things. And you could say, well, there's actually a form of peace that precedes the political. It's spiritual peace. God wants to declare a truce with you because right now you're God's enemy. Romans 5, what is it, verse 10, verse 11, right in there says that. But when a person trusts Christ, they're reconciled to God. The state of warfare is over. And then as you drop down to verse 37, you see a reference there to uh, Christ's first coming. What did he do? You yourselves know... See, Cornelius could have known about this because he lived in Caesarea in the land of Israel where these things transpired. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. So John the Baptist got the ball rolling when he saw Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 29, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the whole world. And then, uh, of course, John the Baptist uh, baptized Jesus. You'll see a reference to that in Matthew chapter 3. Uh, verses uh, 13, well, cutting it down a little bit, Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. It says, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him, and behold, a voice of the heavens said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So all of these people were coming to John to be baptized with his message, and he was offering the kingdom. Matthew 3, verse 2, but then Jesus shows up, and he says, this is the one that all of those Old Testament prophecies point towards. So Peter here points out to Cornelius that this whole thing started with John's baptism. And from there, the ministry of Jesus, which began in Galilee, which is up north there, circle up north, spread throughout the land of Israel down into um, Judea as well. So the, this is kind of a summation that Peter is giving of the, the first advent of Jesus concerning basically his first coming. And then you go down to verse 38, and it talks about Christ's life and work. What did he do exactly? 
Verse 38, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. It's kind of convicting that if Jesus himself had to be anointed with the Holy Spirit to do God's work, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do God's work, and he was the Son of God, I mean, how in the world would I ever think that I can get by on my own natural abilities as a pastor? I mean, if Jesus needed the anointing of God, I, I certainly need it. You certainly need it for what God, you know, has called you to do. And so we need to, as the book of Galatians tells us, walk according to the Spirit. You look at someone on a walker, for example. We have a few here. How dependent they are on that walker. That's what our lives are to be like as Christians. We're to be just depending on on the power and the resources of the Holy Spirit. Because the Christian life is not difficult, it's impossible (laughs) if you try to live it on your own power. But when you draw upon the resources of the Holy Spirit, which God makes available to us moment by moment by faith, it's amazing the things that Jesus is able to reproduce um, in and through us. I'm reminded of Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2, where Jesus said this in the synagogue in Nazareth. I've been to Nazareth and seen a reconstruction of what this synagogue probably looked like. It says in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, this was predicted of him 700 years in advance that he would say this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. So in fulfillment of that prophecy given 700 years in advance, here comes Jesus into that Nazarene synagogue. It says he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, see, Jesus was a what we call a churchgoer. He didn't boycott regular fellowship with God's people. Uh, he attended synagogue regularly, which is what the book of Hebrews says we should do, right? Hebrews 10:25. Is it, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the habit of some? He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. So this is a unique situation here. It says the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. Now keep in mind that They had no, as far as I know, chapter and verse divisions of Isaiah in the time of Christ. It wasn't like, okay, I'm going to preach out of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The the Isaiah wasn't organized that way in his time. He just knew the Isaiah scroll so well that he could go to the exact place with no chapter and verse divisions and begin preaching on the part of it that pointed to him. And then he starts quoting it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, the Isaiah scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down And look at this, the eyes of the the synagogue were fixed on him. I I bet they were. (laughs) Because what he's doing is he's claiming to be the fulfillment of that Isaiah prophecy. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, has been fulfilled in your hearing. 
And what's so interesting about this is he left off part of it. Did you notice that? He left out the second part of verse 2, which says the day of vengeance of our God. Why did he leave that out? Because that's the part of it that pertains to the second coming. And this is very common in the Old Testament prophets. They give you a glimpse of the first coming, a glimpse of the second coming, but they don't tell you about the valley between the mountains. You have to consult the New Testament to get that information. So he reads the part of it that relates to his first coming, and he leaves out the part of it that relates to his second coming. And he says, I'm here to preach uh, liberty and freedom to the captives, and the reason I'm doing this is because God has anointed me to do it. So that becomes a wonderful summation of what Peter is saying here to uh, Cornelius in verse 38. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. So what did Jesus do with that power? Did he lord it over people? No. I'm in Acts 38, chapter 10, verse 38. It says, now he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So he went around doing good. A lot of Christians say, well, what should I do with my life? Well, here's something you could do. Go around, do good. You know, be, be a blessing to people. And as he went around doing good, uh, verse 38, God was with him. Meaning, God was pleased with him. Now, isn't that what God's voice said at his baptism? When he talked about, this is my son, Matthew 3, verse 17, in whom I am well pleased. So God the Father was pleased with God the Son. Now, do you know who else God is pleased with? He's pleased with you. Because you're connected to Jesus. He doesn't see us as we are. He sees us through the shed blood of his son. So you, you may have had a lousy day today or a lousy week and said some things and done some things that you wish you hadn't have done. Well, welcome to the club. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is at the end of the day, God is pleased with you. Maybe some behavior needs to change, but I'm talking about your position. God is pleased with you because he doesn't see us as we are. He sees us through the transferred righteousness of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse uh, 9. So Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but there's a opposite side of that. Satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life, right? The thief, John 10 verse 10 tells us, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So you have to understand that as a Christian, you have God the Father who is insanely in love with you. That's why you're the, we're the bride. And then you have a devil who is insanely in great hatred of you. And just as God is out trying to bless your life and make it count for eternity, Satan's whole agenda is to derail your life, your Christian life. He can't undo your salvation, but he can cause an awful lot of trouble. <laughs> and this is why we're told to put on the full armor of, of God. Hebrews 2, verse 14 of the ministry of Jesus there, says, Therefore, since the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself... Likewise, also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So Satan has a lot of power and Christ came into your life 
to render him powerless. Satan can cause a lot of trouble in a person's life, but he can't take you to hell. He can't take away your salvation. He can't take away God's love for you. And so these are things that are important to remember in the midst of spiritual warfare. And this is why Jesus came into the world. And then Peter, in verses 39 through 41, talks about how we apostles are witnesses to this whole thing. You see a declaration there, verse uh, 39. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. So what was nice about being an apostle is they were appointed unto God to be witnesses to Jesus, of Jesus. That's what Peter's doing in the house of this Gentile Cornelius. He's witnessing you ever ask yourself, why doesn't God just take us to heaven when we get saved? I mean, that would be a lot easier. Well, the answer is he wants to do something through your life now. There are, there are certain things you can't do in heaven. Did you know that? One of them is share your faith with lost people because there are no lost people in heaven. You get that unique privilege right now. And because God has blessed you to be a blessing to other people, you know, that's why he leaves us on the earth. That's what he was doing with the apostles. Aren't you glad, by the way, it calls the land of Israel, the land of the Jews, and not Palestine? <laughs> Have you noticed that? The word Palestine is not in the Bible. Palestine comes from Hadrian, second century, who after the Jews were kicked out of the land by Rome, tried to pretend like the Jews were never there. Which is tough to do with modern archaeology. A lot of us went to see the movie Sunday evening called uh, Patterns of Evidence. Is that the title of it? Boy, what a movie. All the archaeological evidence for the Old Testament in the land of Israel, uh, in Babylon... Uh, and other places. So Hadrian thought he could just wipe out the Jewish uh, presence. It's like the Muslims, what they do. That's, the Muslims are always building uh, structures on top of Jewish holy sites. Do you notice that? Why, why do they keep building on top of? Because they're trying to pretend like the Jews were never there. They're trying to rewrite history. So Hadrian came up with this name, Palestine, and he came up with it from the ancient Jewish enemies called the Philistines. You know, that David fought, etc. And he was trying to make an anti-Semitic slur, Palestine, derived from Philistine. Not just an anti-Semitic slur, but making it sound like the land of Israel was never Israel's. So when Christians use this expression, Palestine, it's like the, them using the expression West Bank instead of Judea and Samaria. Because West Bank, the West Bank is not west of Israel, right? It's east of Israel. The West Bank is west of Jordan, Israel's neighbor. So when we use the expression West Bank, we're using a politically loaded Jordanian term. When we use the word Palestine without really understanding it, we're actually using an anti-Semitic uh, term, you know, going back to Emperor Hadrian. And so the Bible will never use the word Palestine unless it's talking about the Philistines in Old Testament times. It just calls the, la the land of the Jews the land of Israel. I mean, you could jot down Matthew 2, 20 and 21. You'll see the same thing there. Uh, the land of Israel. We are witnesses to these things that he did, both in the land of the Jews and in uh, Jerusalem. And then he highlights here, not just the declaration of the apostles, but Jesus' death. Jesus came into the world to die on a cross for the sins of the world. Verse uh, 39, it says, they also put him to death 
By hanging him on a cross. Now, who's the they? The they is the Jews. Acts 2.23 says this. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you, who's he talking to? The first century Israel. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So you'll notice that the Bible never tries to exonerate first century Israel for what they did to Jesus. But that's a hot potato you gotta handle really carefully because what Christian anti-Semites have done is they've called the Jews the Christ killers. And the last time I checked, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, right? So who killed Christ? Did first century Israel kill Christ? Yes, they did, but is there enough blame to go around for everybody? The Romans participated. The Gentiles participated. Uh, He said, I'm gonna be turned over to the Gentiles. He participated, because in John 10, he says, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down by my own accord. And at the end of the day, we all participated because he died for us. So we're all Christ killers when you think about it. So you have to handle these texts carefully. A lot of people try to exonerate first century Israel. Um, The Bible never does that, but it never places the blame completely and totally on first century Israel. So you see that here that Jesus died according to the predetermined plan of God. But you nailed him to a cross. Well, wait a minute. Was it their free will that killed Jesus or was it according to a predetermined plan of God? Because both are mentioned there. I mean, are are you in favor of free will or divine sovereignty? Because I see both. And people always want to push you on that one end or one end of the spectrum to the other. Be careful of the extremes, by the way. Denying free will and focusing on sovereignty or being totally focused on, uh, let's see, denying free will, focusing on sovereignty, focusing on free will or denying sovereignty is the opposite. So both free will and sovereignty have a role in God's place. I don't want to get so focused on sovereignty that I give up on free will or so much on free will that I give up on divine sovereignty because the Bible teaches both. Both are right there in that passage. So pastor, what do you, what do you believe in? Do you believe in divine will or divine, uh, free will or divine sovereignty? My answer is yes, it's both because I see both right there in that passage. Jesus died according to the predetermined plan of God, yet as that plan of God was being executed, God was using the free will rebellion of his creatures to accomplish the task. Only God can pull something like that off, right? And then he moves away from the death of Christ and he focuses on the resurrection of Christ. We don't just serve a dead savior, right? He's a risen savior and a living savior. Verse 40, God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, later on, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also in vain. If Jesus did not, if there's no empty tomb, because Jesus came out of that tomb, then we might as well just pack it up and go home. Because we're we're serving a Savior that was killed 2,000 years ago and is not alive right now. So we serve a crucified Christ and a resurrected Christ. And as he's talking about the resurrected Christ, he talks about the post-resurrection ministry of Jesus. And you see that in verse 41. Which says, and not to all the people, but to witnesses. 
who were chosen beforehand by God, that is to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So in the book of Acts, as we've studied, Acts 1, there's a 40-day period in between the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension where they're eating together. Uh, Thomas, you remember, is touching his hands and side, which Jesus acquiesces to. They're eating breakfast. They're going fishing. He's telling them to throw their net on the other side of the boat. Maybe you'll catch more fish if you throw your net on the other side of the boat. You can imagine the blow to their pride. That was, we're the professional fishermen, Lord. Just throw your net on the other side of the boat. You'll, you'll have so many fish, you won't be able to pull it in. That's, they finally obeyed and did it. That's during the post-resurrection ministry of Jesus. How could Jesus pull off a miracle like that? Because Jesus knows where the fish are. See, they don't tell you that in Bible college, right? Jesus knows where the fish are. So throw your net on the other side of the boat and you'll have so many fish, you won't know what to do with them all. They're asking him theological questions. Post-resurrection, pre-ascension, about the kingdom. And then finally, he's taken up, he's taken up from them in the ascension. So that there is a reference to the post-resurrection ministry of Jesus. Paul in the resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses four through eight says that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, after he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain alive until now. But some have fallen asleep. So he appeared to Peter, Cephas is his Aramaic name, then to the 12, then to 500 people. Don't take my word for it, Paul says. Go, go talk to them yourselves. Most of them are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. He appeared to James. Now, who is James? That's the Lord's half-brother. Then to all the apostles. And then last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Now there he's speaking of the Damascus Road vision that he saw. So he's dealing here with the post-resurrection and also, to some extent, the post-ascension uh, ministry of Jesus. And he makes a statement here about how we apostles, Peter says, have been chosen to communicate these truths. <clears throat> yeah, Acts 10, verse 41. Not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. What were they chosen to do? To be apostles. They were chosen to serve. And in our study on Calvinism on Sunday mornings, I'll show you that a lot of the passages that people use to talk about one person is chosen unto salvation, one person is not. A lot of them are really, those passages are taken out of context because the choosing has to do with a choice unto service. Uh, Jesus will say this in John chapter 15. He will say, I didn't, you didn't choose me. I think it's in verse 16. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And people will grab that part of it and say, look, God chooses certain people unto salvation, but you just have to keep reading the rest of the verse. John 15 and verse 16, he says to the disciples in the upper room, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit 
and that fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of my Father in my, in my name, he will give to you. The choice there is of the apostles to bear fruit. That's what the whole context is. So does God choose certain people unto salvation? Probably. But do human beings have a choice as to whether they're gonna receive Christ or not? Absolutely. So do you believe in election or do you believe in free will? My answer is yes, I happen to believe in both. Well, that, how do you figure that out? I don't try to figure it out. I quit trying to figure that one out a long time ago. That's like way above my pay grade. I just know that God works in his way and I have responsibilities here on the earth. I'm not to get so hung up on divine sovereignty that I never share my faith with everyone because certain people might be non-elect. The Bible says preach the gospel to every creature, right? It doesn't say figure out if they're the elect first so you can preach the gospel to them. Jay Adams, the great counselor, He's known, has a lot of influence in the counseling world in his famous book, Competent to Counsel, says to his uh, counselees, I never tell, and it's on, I'll show you the quote when, on our, in our Calvinism study. I never tell a counselee that Christ died for him because I don't know if the counselee is one of the elect. That, that is so sad. Every person I meet and have an opportunity to share my faith with, I say Jesus died for you because I don't follow the Calvinistic doctrine of limited atonement. I believe in unlimited atonement. The world is savable, but not saved until people trust in the provision. But the provision is there for anyone who will trust in it. And whether people trust in it or not is their call. Well, how does that work with God choosing certain people? I have no idea. Ask God, don't ask me. I can't figure it out. I just know what God does is his business and what I'm supposed to do is under a divine command. Every human being is savable. I'm not sure how we got off on all that. Verse uh, 41, oh yeah, not to all people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand, that is to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So we apostles were chosen, and you have to look at chosen very carefully here, to be apostles. This is not a text about some are chosen to heaven, some are chosen to hell. And what you'll notice is the passages that Calvinists use typically don't put the passage back in its context. That's, that's why I brought that up. And then he goes on and he talks about the apostolic commission, verses 42 and 43. He talks about the apostles' testimony. Look at verse 42. He says, he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God, look at this, as judge of the living and the dead. So the apostolic testimony is get right with Jesus now. Because he's the judge of the living and the dead. There's coming a time in history when he will render judgment on every single human being, those alive and those dead. Paul on Mars Hill is going to climax his sermon that way in Acts 17, verse 31. It says, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world, that's Jesus, in righteousness through a man whom he appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Jesus is coming back to judge Everyone. And I'm thankful that when I stand before the Lord in judgment, as a believer, he's not going to hold my sins against me. He's going to give rewards or not give rewards based on how I invested my life as a Christian. But the issue of heaven and hell 
is not an issue for me, and it's not an issue for you if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only judgment you'll face is the judgment of rewards. But woe to the person who the transferred righteousness of Jesus has never been applied to them. They have to stand before the Lord at the great white throne judgment. It's described in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. I don't know if we're going to be present when that judgment is rendered. I sure hope not because I don't want to be there. It looks horrific to me. As their names are not found written in the book of life, the resurrected of all ages are transferred from Hades into the lake of fire. And their torment in the lake of fire is determined by what's in the books Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13. If your name is not in the book, never trusted Christ as your Savior, then you're judged by the books. What's the books? I would guess it's a record of sins. And people receive differing degrees of torment forever based on the sins recorded in the books. I don't want anything to do with that judgment. I want to be in the book Remember the disciples came back after offering the kingdom to Israel and they were all rejoicing. Even the demons submit to us. Remember that? Luke 10, I think it is. Jesus says, don't rejoice that the demons are in submission to you. Rejoice that your name is recorded in heaven because there is a judgment coming. And we apostles are out to preach this. That's, that's what I'm doing in your house right now, Cornelius. And then we'll conclude here with verse 43, where Peter makes a quick reference to the prophets of the Old Testament who all pointed to this man, Jesus. Of him, all the prophets bear witness. Now that's the Emmaus Road, right? Post-resurrection. Luke 24, 27, then beginning, this is Jesus, with the Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. And then verse 44, same chapter, Luke 24 says, now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, Tanakh, three major divisions of Hebrew Bible might be fulfilled. The whole Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, points towards me. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, John 5, verse 39 says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these, what's these? The scriptures that testify about me. John 5, 46, if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For Moses, who, by the way, lived 1,500 years ago, <laughs> wrote about me. What does Paul do in Thessalonica? Acts 17, 2 and 3. According to Paul's custom, he went to them for three Sabbaths, that's in the synagogue, and reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this is the Jesus that I am proclaiming to you as the Christ. What scriptures? He keeps talking about the scriptures here. What scriptures are they referring to? Not the New Testament. It hasn't even been written yet. It's Hebrew Bible pointing to Jesus. What, what a great way to evangelize somebody. Did you know that Jesus Christ is the only man that's ever walked the face of the earth where there's history written about him hundreds and thousands of years before he lived? That is, to, to my understanding, totally unique to Christianity. No other alleged holy book can do such a thing. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, for I delivered to you as of first importance that I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. 
And he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. See how it keeps saying over and over again, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures. What scriptures are we dealing with here? We're dealing with Tanakh, Torah, Nabim, Kethabim, law, prophets, writings. Hebrew, they, they organized the books differently than we do, but they're the same books pointing to Jesus Christ. And then after all of this, he gives the gospel. Verse 43. That through his name, everyone who, what? Repents of all their sins. Oh, doesn't say that. Admits they're a sinner, believes on Jesus, and confesses him as Lord. Oh, doesn't say that either. ABC method of salvation. You follow how complicated we've made the gospel into three steps, four steps, five steps, Texas two-step, which I'm going to demonstrate for you up here (laughs) on this stage. The gospel is one step. You hear the truth of the gospel, and there is a single step. There's no ABC. There's no crying. If you want to cry, you can, but you don't have to. Cry a river if you want to. God says you don't have to. There's nothing about, you know, confessing or calling or all these things that people throw in to to a very simple message. The message is one verb, which is to believe. Verse 43, of him the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes receives forgiveness of their sins. It's not clean yourself up and come to Jesus. It's not walk an aisle. There's no altar call here, nothing like that. It's just believe, Cornelius. And then you'll receive the blessing that God promises to the believer, which is your sin debt, past, present, and future, will be wiped out. God's not at war with you anymore. That's why there's an emphasis on peace, verse 36. And I don't know if we need to go through all these verses here, but all of these verses clearly indicate that there's one condition to salvation, faith alone. Some of the classics are John 15, verse 6, John 3, verse 16, Acts 16, verse 30 and 31. Lewis Sperry Chafer says upwards of 150 passages of Scripture condition salvation upon believing only. It is just mystifying to me how people want to run to Romans 10 to develop confession as a condition or calling or whatever as a condition for salvation. They want to go to that obscure passage that really concerns the nation of Israel in the future. That's what Romans 9 through 11 is. They want to build their evangelistic message there. That's where they get the C from. Instead of the 150 crystal clear passages um, that condition salvation upon believing only. So, almost ready to wrap up here, believe it or not. Verse 16, Peter is going to say, I remember the word of the Lord of Acts 11, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did us at the beginning. So the simplicity that's here. Peter in Acts 11 is going to say that's what happened to us on the day of Pentecost. So whatever you're doing with Acts 2.38, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We worked through a lot of that when we were in Acts 2. If you're going to use Acts 2 verse 38 to build a complicated salvation, which many people use that to make salvation very complicated, 
Peter is saying you can't do that. Because in Acts 11, verse 15, he's saying that what happened in verse 44, which is pure simplicity, is the same thing that happened to us at the beginning. So don't come up with an interpretation of Acts 2 of somehow multiple conditions for salvation. The biblical text won't allow you to do that. There's a way to handle Acts 2, verse 38. We don't get baptized to get saved. We get baptized because we're saved. See that? If you're going to take Acts 2, verse 38 and turn it into baptism plus faith equals justification, you're going against what Peter said in Acts 11, verse 15. Because what he's saying in Acts 11, verse 15 is what happened in verse 44 of chapter 10 is what happened to us at the beginning. Verse 44 of chapter 10 is pure and total simplicity. So the pure and total simplicity that you see in Acts 10 verse 44 is, has to be understood as pure and total simplicity in Acts 2 verse 38. So pay attention to that because people like to grab these passages like Acts 2 verse 38, Romans 10, 9 and 10 and build sort of a complicated methodology of salvation. And I'm trying to explain why, the, why chapter 11 verse 15 will not allow you to do that. So that's the end of Peter's message. In fact, it really isn't the end. Um, you kind of get the, feeling that he wants to keep going. By the way, Acts uh, 15 and verse 11 says, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus in the same way as they are also. In other words, if there's simplicity in Acts 15 verse 11, there has to be simplicity in Acts 2. If there's simplicity in Acts 10, there has to be simplicity in Acts 2. I'll say more about this as we get into Acts 11 and Acts 15, but I'm just trying to, you know, wet the whistle a little bit. So Peter finishes his sermon, but I don't think he's really finished. I think he wanted to keep going. But here's Cornelius and his household. They've heard enough. We don't need to hear anymore. We've heard enough. And so they're going to believe. And what's going to happen when they believe? Gentile Pentecost, verses 40 through 48, is going to elapse or manifest itself. Exactly what happened in Acts 2 with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the speaking of tongues. We'll deal with that a little bit next week, speaking in tongues. Exactly what happened in Acts 2 happens in Acts 10. So Peter, through God's grace, won a um, bunch of people to Christ with this simple message because God set the whole thing up. The hearts were prepared. And then we'll move into Acts 11, verses 1 through 18. Did I say next week? Not next week two weeks from now, where Peter is going to have to go back to the ranch, Jerusalem, because the leadership is still in Jerusalem. And he's going to have to explain to them, you know, as Ricky said to Lucy, you've got some splaining to do. <laughs> Uh, Peter has to go back and explain to all these Jewish Christians that, you know what, a Gentile got saved. It really happened. In other words, what happened to, to Cornelius happened to us, and they're kind of doubtful about it. Can a Gentile really get saved? And it's kind of interesting, at the beginning of the church age, the Jewish leadership is wondering, can Gentiles get saved? And now we've been at this for 2,000 years where Gentiles have been saved all over. What is the church debating today? Can a Jew get saved? Beginning of the church age, can a Gentile get saved? God says, just watch me. End of the church age, can a Jew get saved? 
I mean, can God really restore Israel to her rightful place? We doubt that's why we have replacement theology. We doubt that could happen. And just like God said, just watch me at the beginning of the church age, he's going to say, just watch me at the end of the church age. Because there's going to be a rapture. And boy, you're going to see Gen uh, Jewish salvations. You'll have the best seat in the house, by the way, like you've never seen before. So that's where we're going. Father, we're grateful for your truth, grateful for your word, grateful for these folks that would sacrifice a Wednesday evening to hear a somewhat long-winded teacher uh, to, so we can study your word and be better equipped. Help us to walk these things out this week. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. See you Sunday.